Right, my dear doctors. So, welcome to the surgery recall questions of FMG 18 June 2021, part 2. In the part 1, we discussed about various uh, questions like orchitis, mumps virus, the image of uh, rodent ulcer, then uh, the details of margolin's ulcer. Then we discussed something about acute pancreatitis. We discussed about that Cullen sign, that bluish discoloration around the umbilicus, the different operations, whether it was a Whipple's operation or it was a pancreatico jejunostomy for chronic pancreatitis. Then we discussed images related to ecclesia cardia. Then we discussed about this corkscrew esophagus and uh, we discussed about the sort of appearance for diverticulosis of colon. We discussed about this congenital diaphragmatic hernia. We discussed about a clinical case situation of a breast cancer lady presenting with a big breast cancer mass along with lymph nodes. What should be the ideal treatment protocol in this lady? We discussed about the image shown for breast abscess. We discussed about this PUD orange, which is uh, the skin involvement in breast cancer. So that is T4B. We discussed about the CT image for pseudocyst of pancreas. We discussed about this uh, very simple question, pale orphan anionide nuclei seen in papillary thyroid cancers. We discussed uh, about uh, the image, the familial adenomatous polyp image. And we were really glad that we had this uh, covered. We discussed about the foreign body, the food bolus management in a small baby, we discussed about the features of ganglion. The ganglion, they have a very, very high chance of recurrence. Then a repeat question from the last year exam, the right-sided undescended testis, if they are in the inguinal canal and if they are in the perineum, then they are ectopic testis. We discussed about uh, the right-sided testicular torsion, wherein there were some keywords given, like, uh, as you can see, if the testis is found high up in the scrotum, then yes, this is a case of testicular torsion associated with severe sudden onset of pain, redness and swelling of the scrotum. Then uh, we discussed about a MCQ wherein the confusion was between the indirect inguinal hernia and the femoral hernia, but since the hernia reduced on squeezing it through the deep inguinal ring, we gave it to indirect inguinal hernia then how to manage the next step for rectal mass. We were doing a full colonoscopy and biopsy. Then another image-based question. We were very fortunate to have covered these different, different images in the various classes what we had, whether we had face-to-face -face or in the online live or in the Miss Next app. Then we also had this uh, Borman uh, image for gastric cancer. We discussed about this acute cholecystitis scenario. We discussed about the mallory v tear. We discussed about uh, the Homan sign, the deep vein thrombosis. We discussed about the paralysis being the poorest prognostic factor. Overlapping question with ENT, Killian's dehiscence, thyropharyngeus, and cricopharyngeus. How to start the resuscitation for a hemodynamically unstable patient? First, we are starting with the crystalloids, and definitely, if there is huge amount of blood loss, patient is not responding, then we give blood, blood products. So, my dear doctors, let's take a look at more questions which were asked from surgery on 18 June 2021. Now, herein, the Glasgow Coma Scale, which is a very, very hot topic after head trauma, presented in the emergency. On examination, he was able to open his eyes on painful stimuli. Now, herein, I would like to make a point that there is a change in the Glasgow coma scale, wherein now, as per the recommendations, the Glasgow coma scale, the eye scoring, spontaneous is 4, to voice, it is 3, to pressure, it is 2, and no eye opening is 1. Earlier, what we used to write in this eye score in the earlier Glasgow coma scale, four, spontaneous eye opening, three, to voice command, two, to painful stimulus, and one, no response. So, as we had this covered up 
in our regular classes, we saw the old GCS, we saw the new GCS. So I hope you would not have had any problem in looking at this painful stimuli also. Now this withdrawal movements, if we take a look at the motor responses, if the patient obeys the commands, motor six, if he's able to localize, motor five, if he withdraws, motor four, if he shows normal flexion, then motor three, abnormal flexion, motor two, uh, the uh, um, no movement is motor one. So motor six obeys, motor five localize, motor three, motor four is withdraws or the normal flexion, right? Now again, this area, the normal flexion is according to the recent uh, changes according to the advanced trauma life support guidelines. But according to the old GCS story, withdraws was used. So again, they followed this old GCS here. That means the withdrawal belongs to motor four, right? Motor four. Once again, uh, we'll be taking a look at the GCS again because this is a question which would be troubling you in various examinations which might be coming up for you in future. And regarding the verbal story, inappropriate words. So verbal five is when he's fully conscious oriented to time, place and person. Four is confused. Three, inappropriate words. Two, incomprehensible sounds. One, none. <coughs> so if we take a look, this belongs to V3, right? So I, this is two. Motor, this is four, and inappropriate words, this is verbal three. If we take a look at the Glasgow Coma Scale here, now in this you can see, this is the new Glasgow Coma Scale, spontaneous four to sound, it is three. Earlier it was to voice command, now instead of writing voice command, they write to sound. To pressure, it is two, and no response is one. Verbal oriented, confused, inappropriate words, incomprehensible sounds, no response. Motor obeys, localizes, normal flexion, abnormal flexion, extension, and no movement. <coughs> the changes in this Glasgow coma scale earlier, this was to voice, this was to pain, this was withdraws, okay? So the best part is we had all this story covered in the classes, the old one as well as the new one, right? So I hope they would not have had any problem to our students in marking this answer correct. So the right answer for this would be E2, M4, V3. Fine. Let's take a look at another question. Again, we have been discussing about this like anything in our classes, in our clinical case discussions, in our revision sessions, in our test and discussion sessions, in our chanting sessions also. This image, this what we are seeing, this is a case of hyperdense convex. Can you see this uh, convex hematoma here? This hyperdense convex is a classical feature of extradural hematoma. And as we have been discussing that in the image-based questions, look at the image, then look at the options in this, if you don't read the question and just look at the option and you're confident about this image, it becomes easy to mark this as extra dural hematoma, right? However, let's take a look at the question, what scenario he has given to us. A patient suffered from road traffic accident six hours back before he was brought to the emergency with altered sensorium, his Glasgow coma score was 12 and CT scan of the head done, which showed the following he is most likely suffering from. So this is a straight question which is asking you about this hyperdense convex, extradural hematoma. Hyperdense concave is a subdural hematoma. Now my dear doctors, you have this in your study material. You, this image has been discussed in detail in various sessions in the classes. This is a hyperdense convex, you can see extradural. This is again a hyperdense convex. So this is also extradural. But if you look at this, now this is a concave. 
So this hyperdense concave, this is a subdural hematoma. I hope this would help. Fine. Then again an image based question, let us uh, have a look at the image here. Now what is being shown in this image? We can nicely see and compare that here there is hyperlucency. You can see more blackness here and oh my god, what we are seeing in this particular area, we are seeing some shifting towards this side. So this should be a case of pneumothorax associated with the shifting of the mediastinal structures. That means this is a clear cut case of tension pneumothorax. Let us take a look at the options. Now in the options, we had to choose between pneumothorax and tension pneumothorax. So the clear cut answer would be tension pneumothorax because we were able to see the mediastinal shift in the image given in the exam. In hemothorax or hydropneumothorax, we know that if there is fluid collection, the fluid is going to get collected at the bases. So the base area would appear white plus there would be blunting of the costophrenic angle if it is a hemothorax or a hydropneumothorax, right? So I hope there was no issue in marking this answer right. The question is a chronic smoker presented to the emergency, his x-ray chest was done which showed the following. That means it is a straight image based question. If we take a look at the details what we have read in our classes, this is your notes what you are seeing right in front of you. We discussed about the story of tension pneumothorax. If we take a look that what is actually happening, if there is sudden collection of huge amount of air on one side associated with shifting of mediastinal structures like you can see the tracheal shift towards the opposite side, it is a clear cut case of tension pneumothorax and how we are supposed to manage this, again this is something what we had in our lessons in our classes. In tension pneumothorax, which is a dire surgical emergency, respiratory distress, how we are supposed to treat it? We are supposed to do a needle thoracostomy. So we take the widest bone needle available then and there in the emergency. If he is an adult, according to the new ATLS guidelines, we are putting this needle in the fifth intercostal space just anterior to the mid axillary line. While in pediatric age group, we are still putting the needle according to the old story that is in the second intercostal space in the mid clavicular line, right? So this is how we are treating the tension pneumothorax, right? Generally, the preferred needle what we are using is 14 gaze, right? Let us take a look at uh, Another question, let us see whether, okay, so there is no image in this question. Now this looks to be a little lengthy question and in such questions, we are supposed to read the last line of the question first. So here what he is asking is the most likely pathology in this patient, most likely pathology in this patient, okay. We do not know anything, so let us go back. He was offered the treatment of extra peritoneal drainage. Now the key word here is extra peritoneal drainage. So my dear doctors, I hope that uh, you would have uh, looked at this particular thing nicely. The extra peritoneal drainage was the key word here, okay. A patient presented in the emergency with pain in the right iliac fossa. The patient was clinically stable for two days, but then his symptoms started worsening and he was offered the treatment of extra peritoneal drainage. Right iliac fossa, what can be the various causes? If we take a look, there might be appendicitis, there might be torsion of the ovarian cyst, there might be rupture of ectopic pregnancy, there might be a perinephric abscess in this particular area, okay? Now, out of these different options what we see, the first three options could be the answer. Acute cholecystitis can be ruled out immediately. Now the examiner has mentioned extra peritoneal drainage, okay. For rupture ectopic pregnancy, we know that we have to do a laparotomy. We have to go inside the abdomen and deal with it accordingly. For perinephric abscesses, we can simply 
drain the pus easily. But for appendicular abscesses, if there is a localized collection of pus inside the peritoneal cavity, the best thing is do a ultrasound, pass a catheter into the abscess cavity under ultrasound guidance. Now, if my dear doctors, during our lessons, during our classes, what we have been emphasizing on multiple times was that if we are dealing with any infection, okay, if it is a very mild infection, no antibiotics would be required. But if it is a slightly more infection, you might need oral antibiotics. If it is more severe infection, you might need IV antibiotics. If there is any collection of pus, you know, my dear doctors, and I have received so many messages that this concept has helped you like anything to solve this type of question. If there is any collection of pus anywhere inside the body, this has to be drained. If it is a localized collection of pus anywhere outside, you can simply make an incision and drain the pus along with antibiotic cover, incision and drainage and antibiotics. If it is a localized collection of pus anywhere inside the body, like appendicular abscess, maybe pus inside the gallbladder, empyema gallbladder, maybe collection of pus around the pancreas, pancreatic abscess. We have to drain the pus, but the precaution what we need to take is, do not spill this pus inside the body, okay? So whether it is an appendicular abscess, or a empyema gallbladder or a pancreatic abscess, the concept is to drain this pus with the help of catheter so that all the pus is drained outside and nothing spills inside. The name given to these three for empyema gallbladder, we call it as tube cholecystostomy. For appendicular abscess, we call it as extra peritoneal drainage. For pancreatic abscess, we call it as percutaneous drainage under ultrasound or CT guidance. And I'm really thankful for so many messages received by all of you regarding this concept particularly. This is what we have written in our notes. If you just scroll the pages, you have written clearly appendicular abscess, extra peritoneal drainage. And then we wrote about the appendicular mass which require conservative treatment with oshner sharon regime. Let's take a look at another question. Now again, my dear doctors, I'm really thankful to the examiners also and to all the mistakes that since we have discussed about this number of times, that how the pneumoperitoneum looks like, how the intestinal obstructions look like, as we can see, there is gas under the diaphragm here. I hope you can make out this black, black story beneath the right dome of the diaphragm, okay? So this is a case of gas under diaphragm. We can also see this gas under diaphragm on this side as well. And gas under diaphragm would be seen if there is any free air in the peritoneal cavity and from where this free air is going to come inside the peritoneal cavity, most often it would be due to a rupture of a hollow viscous having gas inside like the GI tract. So if there is a perforation in the stomach, duodenum, jejunum, ileum, colon, then we would find this free air in the peritoneal cavity. So let's take a look. This was a straight image-based question. There was no clinical scenario given in this, a lengthy clinical scenario. In this, the options were quite simple. It's a pleural effusion, no. There was a gas under diaphragm, perforation peritonitis, yes. It's a case of perforation peritonitis. Sigmoid volvulus, intestinal obstruction. Clear cut, perforation peritonitis. Another question. Now, I would just like to show you the screenshot of your notes. What we have seen, this is an image given in the standard textbook of surgery, Bailey and Love, wherein we can see how the gas under diaphragm has been demonstrated there, okay? We also had a look at uh, something like this picture during our classes, gas under diaphragm. And herein, we have clearly written that 
we are talking about perforation peritonitis and on x-ray chest we are seeing this pneumoperitoneum right so i hope my dear doctors this would have helped you in the exam another question an elderly woman who did not eat for the last two days she presented with bilious vomiting her x-ray showed the following now in this particular case if you take a look this is a abdominal x-ray demonstrating multiple fluid levels multiple fluid levels as you can see you can see a fluid level like this you can see a fluid level like this you can see a fluid level like this you can see a fluid level here so so many fluid levels are seen also my dear doctors again i thank you from the bottom of my heart all the mistakes for sending so many complimentary messages we discussed it we crammed it also we discussed the concept also behind it single bubble double bubble triple bubble multiple central multiple peripheral single pyloric obstruction double duodenal obstruction triple jejunal obstruction multiple central small intestinal obstruction multiple peripheral colonic obstruction so as the information received on the basis of recall by our students they said there was a multiple air bubbles shown in the x-ray given in the exam and these multiple bubbles were localized in the center <clears throat> so if it is central multiple then it should be intestinal obstruction and since too many bubbles were seen so we went with the distal obstruction in the small intestine fine these were the images which we saw in the class which is also there in your study material this is a double bubble sign which is seen in duodenal atresia and annular pancreas this image this is again a image from billy and love wherein we are seeing the multiple bubbles in the central part of the abdomen and in this image we are able to see multiple bubbles mainly in the peripheral part of the abdomen this you can see here this is the peripheral part of abdomen you can see multiple bubbles on this side multiple bubbles on this side so this should be a case of colonic obstruction right then another question this is again a image based question now this is a histopathology image and looking at this histopathology image it is not easy to identify what the examiner is wanting to know though if we go into the details we can see the chronic infill infill uh, traits the inflammatory infiltrates here with a capsule let us take a look at the question most likely diagnosis now in the question there's a young male scrotal enlargement ldh is high but hcg and alpha fetoprotein were within normal limits histopathology has shown so probably he is talking about a testicular malignancy let's take a look at the options before judging it the options are teratoma seminoma choriocarcinoma and yolk sac tumor now young male scrotal enlargement generally the commonest cause of scrotal enlargement in males is hydrocele but there is nothing like this he has given us the options of testicular malignancies in the testicular malignancies there are germ cell tumors which may be seminomatous non seminomatous now in seminomatous the ldh is high while in non seminomatous if we are talking say about the yolk sac tumors the alpha fetoproteins would be high choriocarcinoma the hcg levels would be high okay so here in the given question he has clearly mentioned that ldh was significantly high but beta hcg and alpha fetoprotein were within normal limits so he is clearly taking us towards a seminoma of testis and my dear doctors you can see here if uh, we take a look at the tumor markers what you have written in your notes you have written about this alpha fetoprotein hcg ldh also if you take a look in the pathology which was also there in the chanting sessions from your mistolinwan book the ldh is raised in seminomas
right? Fine. Let us take a look at another question here. An old male having metastasis in the lumbar vertebra and pelvic bone, what is the most likely diagnosis in this patient? My dear doctors, we know that bony metastasis, they are most often seen in some cancers. The most common is the prostate cancer in males and breast cancer in females. Also kidney, bronchus and thyroid. And what we have read in the classes is that uh, the pneumonic, what we have read for bony metastasis, it is PBKBT, that is prostate, breast, kidney, bronchus and thyroid. And here the examiner is talking about a very old male, the commonest malignancy in elderly male, that is a prostate cancer, right? So, the answer should be prostate cancer if it is given in the options. Let us take a look at the given options. Testicular cancer, this is the most common cancer in a young male. Lung cancer, this is the most common cancer worldwide. Colon cancer, commonly seen in elderly males. Prostate cancer. Now, out of these given cancers, we can easily rule out testicular cancer on the basis of age. But other malignancies can be seen in elderly males. Now we have to differentiate out of these cancers, which cancer would be having bony metastasis more commonly. So we have been taught like anything that in males, in males, in males, the most common cancer going to the bones is prostate cancer. And in females, the most common cancer going to bones is breast cancer. The other malignancies spreading to bones are kidney, bronchus, and thyroid. So, if you have to choose between lung and prostate, the prostate deserves its right to be answered as the best option. And I hope all of you would have done this. Right. Let us take a look at this uh, clinical scenario. Now, here a patient presented with pain in the right hypochondrium. The blood investigations showed AST values 22, ALT values 27, serum bilirubin levels around 5 and alkaline phosphate is 200 milligram percent. That means if AST, ALT are normal, the liver seems to be normal and bilirubin is raised, that means the patient is having jaundice. Alkaline phosphate is markedly raised. So this is a case of surgical jaundice and whenever there is a surgical jaundice, our clinical approach, my dear doctors, once again, I would like to thank you all because in our classes, when we were discussing this right hypochondrial pathologies, whether we were talking about biliary atresias, we were talking about uh, cholidocal cyst or we were talking about cholidocolithiasis, everywhere the screenshots from your notes if we were talking about cholidocolithiasis and we were talking about this jaundice, if a patient comes to us with jaundice, the first investigation is liver function test followed by ultrasound of the abdomen, right? If you take a look at this, the examiner has clearly asked you what would be the initial, initial investigation in this patient. So initial investigation, First you are doing LFT, then you are doing ultrasound. If we take a look at more notes, like we go towards biliary atresia. Now in biliary atresia, the baby is having jaundice and how we are approaching in this, see, initial investigation of choice, LFT and then ultrasound. This is again a screenshot from your notes. Another area was cholidocal cyst where we wrote this particular thing, right? That means I hope all of you would not have had any problem. Surgical jaundice, if the patient is coming to you with jaundice, first LFT, then ultrasound. If the patient is coming to you with a mass in the right hypochondrium, first ultrasound, then LFT. 
that is how we approach these patients and in the given options what we see there was a ultrasound in the option there was ct in the option hepatitis a and hepatitis e markers and heda scan obviously alt ast they are normal so no need of this heda scan definitely is for visualization of the biliary tract but that would be considered in the investigation of choices for different biliary tract pathologies. Initial investigation should be ultrasound, ultrasound, ultrasound. Right. Let's uh, move a little further and see. Now, we, uh, we should thank our examiners for this question. What is the site of maximum pain in acute appendicitis? And my dear doctors, every one of us, knows that how this acute appendicitis presents to us. These were the images what we have seen in our classes. In acute appendicitis, classically, first there is a periumbilical pain which migrate to the right iliac fossa, the McBurney's point, right? And you know what is the McBurney's point? McBurney's point, this is the junction of medial two-third and lateral one-third of a line joining the umbilicus with the anterior superior iliac spine. So this is the McBurney's point and this is the site of maximum tenderness. This is the site of maximum tenderness as well in acute appendicitis. So I hope my dear doctors, no one of us would have committed a silly mistake in this single liner question. Let's take a look. The options were McBurney's point, the flanks, the right upper abdomen, or the umbilicus. So the correct answer is McBurney's point. Fine. Very old male presented with a bellotable mass in the left flank region. Bellotable. Now just look at the keywords here. Bellotable. Bellotable is something which we relate with the kidneys. Left flank he is telling us. On examination, there is painless hematuria. My dear doctors, very old male, painless hematuria. We know this should be a urinary malignancy. Okay? In this particular question, he has written painless hematuria. Also, he has given us that RBCs were found in urine. That's good. Nice of him. While there were no WBCs in urine, that means the infective pathology has been ruled out, most likely cause in this patient. So, bellotable mass, that means there would be a tumor growing inside the kidney, very old male painless hematuria. Let's take a look at the options. Hydronephrosis, that would be presenting as a diffuse enlargement of swelling in the uh, flank region, but painless hematuria may not be relevant. Pyelonephritis, no WBCs in urine, polycystic kidney disease, generally a bilateral pathology presenting at around 30 to 35 years of age, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney. Out of the given options, very old male, painless hematuria and bellotable mass, this take, is taking us towards the diagnosis of renal cell carcinoma. So this was the correct answer for this particular question. In our classes as well, we have written this about uh, this uh, painless hematuria herein. You can see that there is a renal mass growing here and in your notes, you have clearly written about this uh, painless hematuria and mass and the kidney masses, they are generally bellotable, so I hope you would have had answered this also correctly. Now this particular question I feel that uh, this belongs to pathology per se and in this question they asked the pathological examination of breast cancer, signet rings were found, likely diagnosis. Now signet ring in breast cancer, this is something which is quite rare. So we give this particular question in your particular examination to those 10 to 20 percent questions which we might not be aware about. On reviewing the literature, we found that signet, cell, signet ring cell carcinomas, they are rare subtype of invasive lobular carcinoma. 
invasive lobular carcinoma invasive lobular carcinoma that means out of the given options of ductal carcinoma in C2 lobular carcinoma invasive ductal carcinoma not otherwise specified and phyloidist tumor lobular carcinoma seems to be the best answer right let's uh, take a look uh, at another question now this is a uh, cleft lip results from this is a direct question from our chanting sessions failure of fusion of maxillary and median nasal process my dear doctors if you just open the surgery chanting sessions we have highlighted with this particular color during our chanting session if you take a look maxillary process does not unite with the median nasal process resulting in cleft lip on one side and this was again a simple single liner question cleft lip results from failure of fusion of maxillary and median nasal process failure of fusion of two palatine shelves will result in cleft palate separation of nasal septum and vomer from the palatine processes would result in a complete cleft of the palate and this anterior posterior orientation of muscles responsible for closure of velopharynx would be related to cleft of the soft palate right so cleft lip this is resulting from fusion failure of fusion of maxillary and median nasal processes another question a newborn baby with empty scrotum testis was found to be lying close to the peritoneum which of the following may help in the testis reaching in on into the scrotum so for testicular descent if we go into the anatomy embryology even in Bailey and Love they have mentioned this the mechanisms that result in testicular descent are poorly understood but probably involve Mullerian inhibiting substance maternal chorionic gonadotrophin stimulates growth of the testis and may stimulate its migration that means the gonadotropins they may stimulate in migration of the testis let's take a look at the options in the given options the gonadotrophins the GnRH analogs yes testosterone not so much cold compressors and manually bringing the testis down to the bottom of the scrotum that will not be possible in this particular case so the hormones which might help in testicular descent if you have to choose between GnRH analogs and testosterone I would recommend GnRH analogs as we have seen the standard textbook of surgery Bailey and Love mentioning this in the anatomy and embryology of the testis section that maternal chorionic gonadotrophin stimulates the growth of the testis and may stimulate its migration let's take a look at another question if a patient require emergency surgery to survive but there are no relatives who can give consent for surgery what will you do obviously this is a situation where there is nobody to give the consent but you know you are a doctor you are a responsible citizen of the country you know that you have to save the lives why we are called corona warriors why we are called as frontline warriors because the most noble duty what we have to perform is to save the life if we are seeing a patient dying and if this patient by doing emergency surgery if we can save the life of this patient and there is nobody to give the consent we ourselves are solely responsible we'll perform the surgery we'll write what we thought of in the clinical case records because legalities are also important okay let's see what the examiner has given the options will do surgery without consent yes if i am there i'll definitely go ahead with this will do surgery only after getting confirmation from the hospital authorities we do take this consent from the hospital authorities if we have got sufficient time if the patient can wait if we can save the patient after getting all those uh, formalities done then it's okay but otherwise it's a duty to perform the surgery even if the relatives of the patients 
consent is not available. We'll not do surgery at all. No, no, we have to save the life of the patient. We'll wait for the relatives to come and give the consent. No, we'll not wait for the relatives. Patient is going to die if we delay the surgery because in the question, the examiner has clearly written, if a patient require emergency surgery to survive, emergency surgery to su survive, then we will take the responsibility. According to the standard textbook, Billy and Love, this is what they mentioned there, the moral and legal rules that govern such situations are clear. The doctrine of medical necessity enables the surgeon in an emergency to save the life and prevent permanent disability operating without consent. Operating without consent. Okay? So I hope you have got the crux of this. So the correct answer for this question would be, will do surgery without consent in such situation. But if the patient can wait, we'll definitely inform the hospital authorities that we are going ahead with something like this. Radioisotope used in thyroid cancer treatment, my dear doctors, for thyroid, we know the thyroid follicles, they take up iodine. And the iodine-131 is what we are commonly using. So in the given options, the iodine-131, 99 technetium, 89 strontium, and 133 cesium, iodine-131 was the best answer. Once again, radioisotope used in thyroid cancer treatment, iodine-131. And this is something just to, for you that uh, iodine-131 can be given in order to deliver tumorocidal doses of radioactivity directly to the thyroid tissue for both benign and malignant tumors in the thyroid. Most common radioisotope used in PET scan, my dear doctors, you all remember that how multiple times we have chanted this during our regular classes, the face-to-face, -face, the online live, or even in the MIST Next app, that isotope used in PET scan is 18-FDG, fluorodeoxyglucose, 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 and the half-life is 110 to 120 minutes. And this is something which we have done multiple times in our chanting sessions as well. Out of the given options, he has given 18F only. He did not mention DG there. So fluorine is something which is used in PET scan. So 18F was the best answer for this particular question. I hope none of the mysterians would have marked it wrong. 13 carbon, 14 carbon, all of the above. The 18 fluorodeoxyglucose, I feel, was the best answer. Fine. We have written this in the notes as well. And a patient presented with persistent vomiting, most common findings in acid balance analysis in this patient. My dear doctors, again, this is a repeat question from the last year. We know that when we were talking about pyloric obstructions, whether we were talking about hypertrophic pyloric stenosis or gastric cancer causing this, the stomach would be distended, dilated, forceful vomiting, acid will be lost, chlorine will be lost. So there would be hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis. If you see your notes here, you can see in pyloric stenosis, this is what you have written, metabolic alkalosis, hypochloremia, and you have also highlighted this in your notes. So my dear doctors, this is all about the part two session for the surgery FMG recall questions in these two, part one and part two FMG recall surgery questions, we have gone through 52 questions, 51 or 52 questions, I hope. And this simply means that whatever type of questions are there, my personal analysis is, there were certain questions which we can give to the radiology people, like we can give the pneumoperitoneum, we can give the tension pneumothorax, uh, we can give a few other uh, radiological images questions to the radiologist as well, but these are something which we discuss in surgery as well in detail. There were certain questions which are overlapping with pathology, like there was an image shown to us of uh, a patient whose uh, 
HCG and alpha fetoproteins were normal, LDH was raised, that was seminoma of the testis. There was an overlapping question of Killian's dehiscence with ENT. There were few overlapping questions with anatomy as well, right? So from the core surgery, we would have got at least 35 questions. That means we as doctors need to be nicely equipped. There are few subjects which are high scoring, which are easily understandable and easily remembered, which include pathology, the ENT, ophthalmology, forensic medicine, PSM, surgery, OBG. These can definitely change the lives in the FMG exam. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for watching with patience. I really wish all the foreign medical graduates a big, big all the best for their results. And I believe that they should come out with flying colors in this June 2021 exam. Thank you very much. God bless you.